During the 1950s and 60s, Australia had built a formidable reputation as one of the most successful nations in the history of amateur sport. And the people were deeply grateful and richly fulfilled and everyone was happy. Australia went to the Montreal Olympics in 1976 and won no gold medals at all. Finished 32nd on the medal table. We didn't even know the medal table went down that far. The top nations were quite simply the countries that had spent the most money. Amateur sport was as dead as vaudeville. For the next 20 years, Australia would get its fix of national identity from domestic sport. And the national identity would change and the country would watch itself becoming a different nation on television through the miracle of football. This was safer too. In domestic sport, Australia never loses. We'd come back in international sport. Of course we would. It says so in the Constitution. But it would take money and planning and time. And it would take character. And it would have a deadline too, because what we wanted to do was host the Olympics again and do well in them at home. Australia is a sporting nation. We need to do both. Both my wife and I um, look forward to meeting you. By that time, uh, it'll, I suppose, be known who's been successful and who's not been successful. In 1976, Australia went to the Montreal Olympics with a team of top flight, world class amateur athletes, just as we'd always done. The ABC would like to warn viewers that the following sequence contains material which many of you might find upsetting. I always say I was part of the most unsuccessful Australian Olympic team ever. In 1976, we didn't win a, a gold medal at the Olympics. I think uh, that's considered by many the nadir of, uh, of our Olympic performances uh, in living memory. And Australia went to the Games with some chances. Holland is not going to win, I don't think he's has fallen back to third place. Stephen Holland broke his own world record in the 1500 metres freestyle, but it wasn't about the time. He was a gallant third. Other countries had just got better. Goodell, Hackett and Holland are there's a great race. A false start. We couldn't take a trick. Another good chance was Raylene Boyle. She'd won silver at the previous two Olympics and her campaign in the 200 metres was going beautifully until she was disqualified for breaking in the semi-final. I know I didn't break and I took that for granted. Some days I think I should have just turned around and chased the field and passed them and <laughs> even if I didn't get to run the final, just sort of been naughty, but they probably would have shot me. <laughs> Another big chance was the men's hockey team of which Rick Charlesworth was a member. They made it to the final and were beaten by, I just forget who beat them. I think it might have been a sports-loving country out to the east of here. Of course, our team playing in the final was the, the big chance. And of course, uh, then the, the great disappointment of losing uh, the final. Uh, and it's damned hard to get to the final in the Olympics. People, again, didn't realise how hard it is to win. And particularly with very, very little support backup. And, uh, you know, so my bronze medal was a big deal at the time. But uh, again, it was amateur hour relative to other nations. It's a mood of frustration and disappointment. The Australian team has learned the hard way of the conditions and excellent facilities in many other countries. To give you a sense, the East Germans, they built an Olympic village in preparation for 1976 in East Germany with the same street signs and the same environment. So they were at ease and at peace when they went to their village in, in Montreal. Wow. Yeah, yeah, the preparation was huge relative to little old Australia. We did pretty well in the 50s and 60s, and we had a home Olympics, which always tends to, to stimulate activity. Um, but that was falling away by the time we got into the 70s. And the other thing that was happening, of course, in the 70s is that the Eastern Bloc countries got serious about sport, spent a lot of money and uh, used substances to improve their performance. And many of those records, which 
which were said at that time still remain, especially in women's sports. So it's, I think it, it tells us what was happening. There was now a wide gap between these highly professional sporting apparatchiks and good honest doers like Australians. Australia had an image of itself that was based on something that wasn't happening anymore. Crisis. Talks were held at the highest level. Did we exist properly as a nation without sporting success? What did we want from sport? Healthy children and fun in the weekends or continuous international sporting success? We wanted continuous international sporting success and we were prepared to pay for it. It became clear, I think, that if we weren't going to get a lot of extra support for sportsmen and women, we were going to go on falling behind. Um, and that, to me, almost put the question in simple terms. Were we going to be in the race or out of it? We swallowed hard and built a dirty great big government-funded sports training institute. It wasn't actually called the Australian Institute of Underdogs. Underdogs wouldn't fit on the sign. Essentially, the government did four things. They provided resources for facilities. They supported athletes in a way in which athletes hadn't been supported before. Um, they introduced coaches and they provided for competition for us to play international competition. Up until then, we were lucky if we played 10 matches a year. Now, you know, if our team doesn't play between 30 and 40 a year, then we're, we're, we're really not staying up with the game. The first director of the Institute of Sport was swimming coach Don Talbot. He was keen. He liked it more when Australia won. I've got an unashamedly mix. I want us to win. I don't like being second string to anybody, right, in, in performance aesthetically. And I made up my mind then that that Institute of Sport was not going to be a white elephant and we're going to be number one. Getting back among the top Olympic nations wouldn't be easy. A lot of them were having precious metals for breakfast. Don took it on because he really wanted it to work. He just didn't know how yet. When I got it, I thought, oh God, what am I going to do? How do you do this? And we were just neophytes. We were just starting. And so, and I, did, I knew nothing about it. So I managed to cajole a handbook on collegiate swimming, uh, which stated all the rules, how to set it up and what to do. and, and I mean, they were very hard to get, and I had to steal it virtually in, in the US, and I, and I used that as the model. This is Kieran Perkins. When Australian sports dark night of the soul began in 1976, he was three years old. You know, we all go through that natural progression. You know, you start at across the pool and then you go to 25 metres and then to 50 metres and to 100 metres, and, and as you sort of reach these, these benchmarks of, of skill, they sort of let you go a bit further and a bit further and a bit further. Um, the reality is I'm a distance swimmer. I was never successful at those young, at those shorter distances. I never did well as a young athlete. We used to have these big, big polystyrene kickboards, the old style polystyrene, and they break them in half and break them in half as you progress. Like your progression was built around the size of the kickboard that you had, and, and I sort of got to the point in the end where I had this inch piece square of foam that I, I needed to be clutching in my hand, or I'd certainly drown. You know, it's uh, it's funny how you uh, how you remember these things. The men's 1500 metres freestyle is the Olympic event Australia has most dominated. Since 1920, 42 Australians have got to the final in this event and 22 of them have won a medal. At the age of nine, Kieran had a bad accident running through a plate glass door and he took up swimming as part of his recovery program. Kieran's recovery from that accident would perfectly match the recovery of the nation. Until further notice, we would turn up at international sporting events as a remote amateur nation with a population of 12, some borrowed equipment and a bit of a niggle in the hammy. This so-called underdog phenomenon really appeals to us. I mean, there's something of the underdog, the under mongrel, uh, in Australian culture. If we lose, well, we were the underdogs anyway, but if we win, this is 
much more spectacular than being the predictable favourite who won. After Montreal, one man saw Australia's need for affirmation and national confidence in sport, not as a matter of government policy, but as a market. The biggest change in sport was about to happen in our living rooms. When Hacker arrives on the scene, cricket is still overwhelmingly dependent on the gate as a, as a source of revenue. It hasn't realised the potential of broadcasting rights. And when Packer begins to talk about the kind of sums of money that he can offer, the board almost don't want to hear about it. Uh, it, it, it rings false in their ears. It's like the worship of, of graven idols. And, of course, the first time Packer comes to see them, they send him packing. Uh, even when he says to them, come on, gentlemen, we're all whores, what's your price? You know, there have been more honeyed words to, uh, to <laughs> amateur sporting administrators in, uh, in history. They can say what they like about me. If they start to victimise the players who've placed their trust in me, at that point in time, it's an all-out scrap. When he wasn't given the right to broadcast the national game, despite having offered the Australian Cricket Board eight times more than the previous contract, Kerry Packer bought some players and created his own rogue competition for television. And if they wouldn't let him hire the cricket ground, he hired a football ground. And if he couldn't buy Australian cricket, he'd spontaneously combust World Series cricket, a game played almost entirely in Australia. There is a myth that Kerry Packer made cricket popular in Australia. In fact, he covered it because it was popular already and it provided a ready access to an instant audience who were excited and engaged by this particular generation of Australian cricketers. And as it happened, there was considerable discomfiture and agitation among cricketers around the world about the subsistence wages which they were being paid, which meant that he was able to recruit the best 60 players in the world without really working up a sweat and put them into his own televised independent cricket circus here and attract a mass audience. World Series cricket became series television. It explained the game to women, who were the majority of daytime viewers. It developed screen graphics, it told stories, there were cameras everywhere, it introduced night games with a white ball. And after a while, the number of people at the games actually began to increase. Lily's pounding down like a machine. This would change cricket and would change television. And not just cricket, and not just television, and not just in Australia. This was big. Come on, Aussie, come on, come on. World Series cricket sold the Australian public its own image of itself. Unsurprisingly, this rather appealed to them. Come on, come on, come on. There's no doubt that uh, one of the major appeals of sport is its appeal to tribalism. Um, one of the features of tribalism is that we, we get a strong sense of identity this is as primitive as sport itself. Television mediating what tribalism is can get confusing. Sport is marketed as a celebration of what it is to be Australian. Australians hitting other Australians and other Australians being stretched off is then an expression of everything we stand for. It's a curious thing uh, and it's very obvious in Australia that we're trying to import some kind of nationalist fervour into games where the teams are not national teams at all. I mean, the idea that at a state of origin rugby league match, you would play the national anthem before the game, <laughs> you're sort of looking around, so, so which other tune are they going to play, <laughs> you know, for the other mob? No, no, it's all us. Uh, state of origin football exists in rugby league purely for Queensland to demonstrate that um, that giant chip they've got on their shoulder can occasionally be removed by defeating the despised people from the south. <laughs> it exists purely for Queensland to boast to the world how successful they are. 
Packer Cricket had established that the relationship between television and live attendance was synergistic. The crowd had become the television audience and tribal rivalries were big business. This was new and like everything new, it was old. In ancient Rome, they used to say the way to keep the masses happy was to give them bread and circuses. It's a fair bit more sophisticated here in Australia. You can get a pie and sauce here. Oh, what a kick by Jimmy! What a kick! In the early 1980s, football was absolutely on the bones of its arse. You know, three or four of the clubs were facing extinction. Crisis is an immense begetter of change it suddenly begins to realise that if it's going to prosper, that it needs to be a national code. So that's the way to maximise broadcasting revenue. That's the way to, to maximise advertising revenue. We can't go on being a Victorian sport. Rugby League immediately identified that it was a game built for the box, insofar as it's a rectangular field. Um, it has a play the ball about every 30 seconds or so, which will allow the camera to focus right on it. It has a moving defensive line and a sweeping attacking line. It is perfect for the camera. Television had become a very big business indeed. And it had worked out that sport had everything. It had heroes, it had stories. Kids loved it, advertisers loved it. It was on every week. And at the end of every contest, you got a result. Good. When you watch sport, of course, it's not just sport you're watching. In the 50s and 60s, nearly three million European migrants arrived. And as their children were born and grew up here, the cultural mix began to change. They were called New Australians, an ecumenical and non-discriminatory term used by the open and very welcoming host community to describe the Poms and Wogs and Dagos who are now all over the joint eating strange and vaguely alarming food. Our vast immigration policy, which is the most important thing that's happened in Australian history. We've transformed this country by this massive uh, immigration brought people from about 180 different countries. It's uh, enriched us uh, economically and culturally, uh, uh, sporting. Uh, when I see these names in the cricket side and the football side that have obviously come from other non-British uh, backgrounds and cultures, I think it's just, just a marvellous vindication of, uh, of what's happened. This being Australia, these changes were seen in sport before they were seen in many other places. Post-war migration policy was built around the need for skilled and unskilled labour as the country develops and to populate. I mean, it wasn't a policy about recruiting great sports people to the country, but it was about um, enhancing its economic potential and development. Um, but in that, um, you do inevitably get people who are going to uh, excel in other parts of uh, society, and sport is one of them. Oh, that marvellous mark, <laughs> one of the great sporting pictures of all time. I described it as the moment when multiculturalism arrived in Australia because, you know, all of a sudden, this great moment is supplied with a man with this name, Jesselenko. Look, my mark has a few things going for it. It's played in front of 121,000 people. It was a grand final. It was against Collingwood. It was in black and white. <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a few ticks. <laughs> oh, I tell people that I took better marks at training. We began to see completely new names starring in sport on television. Names we didn't even know how to pronounce properly. Like Robert. And of course, as a young boy growing up, you know, in a primary school situation, I, I used to get called names by the Anglo-Saxons, you know? And uh, I think to myself, well, how can I get back to these guys? And because you could play sport, because I could run and jump and skip and hop and all those sort of things, I, I took the game up uh, of AFL football, as we call it today. And all of a sudden, you know, people wanted to know a lot more about you and uh, where you come from, and they wanted to be part of you and your friends because you could play it footy at a young age, and plus gave me the opportunity to fix up a few boys too. As a kid growing up, you can fast track your in integration or inclusion into a society by taking on the, a team or support of, of a team. 
uh, and that's an immediate way of bonding to the host culture and the host community. Certainly it happened in league uh, at Western Suburbs. My captain was Tom Radonikus of Lithuanian Swiss parentage. And I can remember at Lidcombe Oval, we had a significant Eastern European audience to, to our matches. And uh, then across uh, Sydney at the Canterbury Bulldogs, you had George Paponis. Uh, both those two, Radonikus and Paponis, in that period, captained Australia, which sent a further message to the migrant masses. Not only will we pick you in first grade, but we'll let you lead the, the team out onto the, the national team out onto the field. A lot of our migrants back in those days never came to the footy because they didn't know much about it. You know, they would stick with their own, you know, cooking the pastas and whatever. And, but because of television, hey, this is Boyko Di Pia Domenico. He's Italian, he's one of us. Beautiful, beautiful, you know. And then when you walk the street, they said, hey, I'm Italian. What you've done is beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And you think, well, yeah, what have I done? But you've allowed them to live in this country in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a better place, you know. Dipper ended up playing 240 games for Hawthorne from the age of 16, culminating in a Brownlow medal win in 1986. You know, I've won some great awards in this uh, game, um, you know, the Brownlow and, and uh, premierships, which is what we play for, and it's just an amazing journey I've been on. But one of the, one of the most amazing awards I ever won was the Italian Sportsman of the Year. They come from nowhere. I got an invitation. We now have an Italian Sportsman of the Year. It was like a wedding. Like, everybody, it was a dinner dance. People come along, mum and dad were wrapped. They were high-fiving people, you know? Um, do you know what I won? Normally, you get a medal or whatever. I won, I won, uh, I won a suit and I won a, a bedspread. One of those, uh, <laughs> that was my award, a suit and a bedspread. Mum goes, Be Be beautiful. <laughs> and mum's still got the bedspread <laughs> on her bed. And she loves it, you know, because this is my boy. My boy won this one. Uh... Another option for European migrants was to play the game they brought with them. Soccer evangelist and commentator Les Murray arrived in Australia from Hungary as a young boy. I remember saying to my father, well, uh, when you decided that we should come to Australia of all countries, you never, never considered this, did you? That in fact, this is not a football country. Uh, this is a massive shock to us. Some kids actually told me that uh, they were convinced that rugby league was the world's most popular sport. Uh, and that's how isolated a society Australia was uh, at the time. While the local games absorbed migrant players and supporters into Australian society, soccer provided a weekly reenactment of internecine rivalries at the latter end of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. To describe the broader Australian public as confused is probably to overestimate their interest. Sydney's leading soccer club, Napier Leichhardt, is challenged by St George Budapest in the all-white. The other thing that sport can do that's negative, of course, is entrench prejudice, especially racial prejudice. Uh, we, we saw that for years and years and years in soccer in Australia, where soccer teams were actually ethnic teams. And so uh, when the Serbs played the Croats uh, or whatever it was, this, I mean, this, this was ancient tribal hostilities breaking out every Saturday. Public address announcements trying to get the crowd off the park. Olympics fans went berserk. This image was a barrier uh, to further progress because the population at large felt that this is the WOG's game and we don't want to be part of that. So they felt... Uh, that it was not, it was un-Australian to follow soccer, not because the football wasn't any good, but because that was the game for the Wogs. Caught in the middle of the savagery was City's goalkeeper Tony Pizzani. That exit tunnel must have seemed an eternity away. But for the Australian public, the Lilliputian rivalries that characterised local soccer paled into insignificance when the biggest competition in the world came to town. 
before a packed crowd at the Sydney Sports Ground, uh, we had a chance to see the Socceroos in a World Cup qualifier at last. Australia versus Israel. And as I looked around that stadium, 33,000 back to the rafters, that was capacity. It was uh, all the colours of the rainbow in terms of the racial and ethnic mix of the audience uh, that was there. Uh, but the difference was that these people uh, this time were all cheering for the same team. It was there that I first felt really Australian. Here's the chance for Australia. A bonny to Barnes, to Watkins, and that's the equaliser. One all, but Australia's effort has come too late. The match is just about all over, and Israel have won the series on aggregate two to one. Even though we lost, it was here that a lot of Australian sports fans took up an interest in soccer. This was the World Cup. And these weren't just wogs, they were our wogs. They'd gone up a division. Meanwhile, in international news, the Olympics were in some trouble. The Moscow Olympics were a complete shambles following the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, and there was a sort of a partial, slightly disorganised, semi-official Australian boycott. Well, put it this way, the Australian government decided not to officially boycott the Games, but to allow the athletes to decide for themselves that perhaps they didn't want to go. The decision to go or not to go was made at many different levels, including on an individual level. Um, some people were members of sports that went, but they as individuals did not want to go. And, um, you know, there were a lot of people who wished that uh, all that bit of sporting history could have could have been written differently. Moscow was a great disappointment for us as athletes. For those of us who had been unsuccessful at the previous Olympics, we had a very good team. We were four years older, we were ready, and perhaps at our prime. And uh, so it was a great disappointment not to go there. The next Olympics were also affected by a boycott. The Olympic franchise was in some trouble. So it perhaps didn't matter that we weren't quite back in business yet. There were some highlights in international sport. Yvonne Goolagong won seven Grand Slam tennis tournaments and Australian rugby was about to produce one of the great sides, which would completely change the game. Just keep your eye on Mark Eller here. Eller, drop it goal, is good, hits the post. Eller goes himself and Eller will score. Oh, what a try! Sure, we got national a bit of it. You have to work awfully hard to actually be able to get away with that. But the philosophy was simple, you know, you, you, you align shallow, you hit the ball straight, you pass the ball at speed, and then you support. Mark Eller grew up in a part of Sydney where Aboriginal people have lived for seven and a half thousand years, but which is named after a French navigator who spent six weeks there in the summer of 1788. We were just on the edge of the, the, the mission at La Perouse. I mean, I guess the sport was a distraction. And, and, and a way out. On the weekends, it was divide and conquer because mum and dad didn't have a car. You know, they had about eight children playing sport, whether it was netball, rugby league, rugby union. So they'd, they'd mum would go one way, dad would go the other way, and if they, they got lifts to, to the next lot of games, fine. If not, they just jumped on a, on a bus and, and just sort of went everywhere. And, and, Without their support, and, and all my brothers and sisters will say, you know, we probably would have done other crazy things, but they supported us through thick and thin, and they did it, you know, without access to, to cars and, you know, just got lifts, and, but they were terrific. We always wanted to play rugby league. That was our, um, our main goal. It wasn't until the last year of school where, where our, our, again, Jeff Mould, come and said, you guys are going to give up rugby rugby league and, and concentrate in reunion. And, and we said, why? And he said, well, don't you know at the end of the year there's an Australian school besides England, Island, Wales, France, Holland and Japan? And we said, so? What's it got to do with us? And he said, I think you guys can make it. And we said, we'll never make it. We're opposite Long Bay Jail. And he said, you guys are idiots. Don't you know I'm coach that team? So we said, OK, fair enough, we'll give it away and give up rugby league. And we concentrated on rugby union for the last... I guess half of the, our final year at school. And you know, we made that school by side, and I guess the rest is history. The school boys compiled a magnificent record in its recent tour of Japan, the United Kingdom, and Holland, and become known 
as the new Invincibles. This schoolboy side, which contained Mark and two of his brothers, became the basis of what would become the most successful rugby side in the world. Uh, it was just a phenomenal side. It's just, I guess, once in a, in a lifetime that you get a bunch of players to play that style of rugby. And uh, again, I think there were nine or ten Wallabies, and, and, and obviously Wally Lewis went on to be one of the immortals of, of rugby league. Again, we're playing as schoolboys. We didn't think what we were, the impression we were making in, in Australia. And I remember, again, coming home and, you know, we, we got up in the morning and, and Mum gave us three daily telegraphs and said, you made the paper. And she gave us the sports side, you know, first. So we could sort of looking through the paper and go, Mum, we're not in the papers. What, what are you talking about? And then said, turn the paper around. And on the, the whole page of the Sydney Telegraph was Glengarry and I in, in their dirty England jerseys that we hadn't had a chance to wash. We were on the whole front page. The whole front page was just three Ella brothers. Outside the big cities, kids who dreamt of a future in sport relied on being talent spotted. And as the sports got bigger, the business of talent spotting became more competitive and the talent spotters went further out. The visibility of Indigenous players in AFL football began to increase, to say nothing of its impact on the game. A great example in this period was probably Kevin Sheedy's famous Essendon side. Kevin Sheedy has done it again for the Bombers. He gets a group off the men, and then he constructs this young side that no one really gives a chance. They win it. And in the grand final, Michael Long wins the Norm Smith medal. And one of their best young players, Wayne Ganane, who's Aboriginal, he wins, he's the first Aboriginal player to win the Brownlow. And that's, that changes everything. That changes everything. The AFL have stolen the high moral ground on this, believing that they are the, the lofty custodians of, of all that is proper about how to handle um, racial slurs on the football field. Um, rugby league dealt with that problem about 40 years, 50 years earlier, simply by making Arthur Beats and the an Indigenous guy captain of the Australian uh, rugby league team. Sport can um, make us feel as though something has been achieved because of success in sport, where there's still a lot more to be achieved, particularly when it comes to things like um, dealing with problems of poverty or marginalisation in a society. What happens on the sports field does have an influence. I think it has a big influence. But um, you wouldn't want to be evangelical about the influence it has. And, um, and racism, I mean, in, in, in its crudest form still exists and can still be found relatively easily. And it's tempting to overlook all that if we've got enough success stories of people who came from, uh, from extremely humble origins, almost as if to say, humble origins are good for you. Uh, and that's, that's a pretty odd argument that leads to some uh, unattractive conclusions. After Packer cricket had blitzed the ranks of Australia's most accomplished cricketers, the young and inexperienced Australian national team got beaten rather a lot. But cometh the hour, cometh the man. There were two questions you asked in cricket in this period. What's the score? And is Alan Border still in? Not since Bradman has a player been as integral to Australia's fortunes as Alan Border was in that period of Australian cricket austerity in the 1980s. Last night ended with a sight that Melbourne cricket fans hadn't seen for some time. A smile on Alan Border's face. Border is kind of our Horatius on the bridge. He is the one man holding up this resistless West Indian tide. And it calls forth from him particular qualities that I'm not sure even he knew was there. This capacity for stubbornness and, and resistance and, and flintiness. We'd got so used to not winning, we developed a national hero out of a bloke who specialised in not losing. Or at least not losing by quite so much. If you go to the sports section of the Bible, you'll find the archetypal underdog story, David and Goliath. 
David was just a kid. He was an amateur. I think he was from Adelaide. And he wasn't expected to go too well against Goliath, who was the reigning world champion. He was a professional, had all the right equipment and plenty of big sponsors and so on. Anyway, David came out and cleaned him up. Well, no one had beaten the Americans for 132 years of competition. So any foreigners were underdogs. The Americans were very good at what they were doing, you know, very well organised, tremendous resources, funding and so on, technology behind them. And they weren't in the business of losing. <laughs> it was the best of seven. We were 3-1 down. I don't think I'm giving anything away in suggesting that 3-1 down in a best of seven contest against someone who's never been defeated in the history of the event is a reasonably character-building experience. You know, the probability of winning from 3-1 down was probably 1,000 to 1 against. But we came back 3-2, 3-3, and eventually that final race. The Americans were ahead by 57 seconds. And you remember they came in and we just went round that final boy. Their nose in front and they had that marvellous tacking duel all the way down. John Bertrand and his crew had their prize in sight and with every tack they moved a little further ahead. It was one of the great moments in sporting history. It's going to be Australia too. They are going to win it. Stand up Australia. And of course, of all the brilliant things I said as Prime Minister, the many, many brilliant things, what's been remembered more than anything else was my comment <laughs> that any poor who sacked a person from being late today is a bum. That's remembered much more than anything else I said. All of those things sort of epitomise the spirit that this country is very proud of, and that is to be able to fight against impossible odds and to be successful. And I think looking back on it, all those elements are, are very important on why the event was such a big deal in Australia, because as you quite rightfully say, you know, the number of people involved in sailboat racing is tiny. But it wasn't just that sporting achievement, it was also the technological achievement. Um, there was America with all its accumulated experience in technology much more than us. But we, well, the, the keel and the wing keel and uh, the tribute to our expertise as sailors, but also a great tribute to our achievement in a technological sense. Other than Australia too, there was another confidence about Australia too. Protective trade barriers were lowered. The dollar was floated. We stopped God saving the Queen and we started advancing Australia fair. Superannuation grew as people took responsibility for their own retirement. Sky didn't fall in. Maybe we were okay. Maybe we'd grown up. Perhaps we didn't need sport any... Oh, hang on. Shh. This could be important. The, the winner is Sydney. Okay. What a great moment. And this was quite nice timing. By the late 1980s, Australia had quietly begun to improve its Olympic results, often with heroic individual underdog performances. Glynis Nunn, Dean Lucan, John Sieben, Duncan Armstrong and Debbie Flintoff King. Don Talbot was now the head coach of Australian swimming and what he wanted to do was to turn individual swimmers into members of one mutually supportive unit, Team Australia. Now, Don turned up and said, I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from. I don't care what state you live in. I don't care which club you train at. Australian swimming is going to become the number one swimming nation in the world by working together, supporting each other, sharing knowledge and information, techniques, training with your main competition. Because if you're on your own doing it, you'll never work hard enough or strive or, or challenge yourself. We kicked and screamed about it because we weren't happy about the fact that he was wanting us to do things like go to every single heat and final session of a swimming competition. You know, we wanted to be at home resting and getting ready for our own race, but he wanted us there, dressed in green and gold, cheering our teammates on, so it created this atmosphere. And the philosophy was to build a team where 
that we'd see each other and you're, you're a member of the team, I'm a member of the team, and even though you're on the female side, on the male side, we're still, we're the same. We're all Australian people and we, we want to win. And then you can get your own glory out of it if you swim well enough. At the Barcelona Olympics in 1992, Kieran Perkins was 18. He was competing in the 1500 metres freestyle. There are probably reasons we've always gone all right in this one. I often joke with people, you know, you, you're talking about a country that likes a, a, a sport that can go for five days and end in a draw. You know, our favourite motor car race is, is a thousand kilometres. Um, we, we do as a country seem to like those kind of really long, drawn out things, and you know, the 1500 is the longest we can get in the pool. Kieran Perkins won the 1500 metres by half a lap and broke the world record. That's Glenn Houseman from Rockhampton coming second. If this event is the barometer of this sporting nation, things were starting to look good. In Barcelona, the pure Australian better than anyone else harked back to the Golden Age elite athlete was Kieran Perkins. The tough, indomitable figure who refused to be defeated was Cathy Watt. Cycling's a great sport. There's so much colour and excitement and there's a danger element as well. And as riders just putting it on the limit. And it's very tactical, so there's all different ways um, races can pan out. And it's not, uh, not necessarily the best person who will win. Is it rough? Yeah, it's rough. You have to <laughs> fight for your position and that's, that's part of the learning curve. Like, I came from running and I'm good running in a pack and I know what to do, but when you come into cycling, you have to learn how to hold your position in the bunch um, or where you want to sit or what to do to stay out of the wind and to get the most assistance. Cycling had always been one of Australia's most successful Olympic sports, but women's cycling wasn't introduced until the 1980s. Cathy Watt is now an elite sports photographer. No surprises there. She's been involved in cycling now for 20 years. When she started, Cathy was the prow of the good ship Australian women's cycling. When I went to sign up to cycling, I got asked, could I bake scones? <laughs> so that, and I, I said yes, and then I said to the old guy, can you? And he, and he said yes, but then a year later, when he saw that I was serious about cycling, he helped me get into my first world championship team, which was really good. I guess when I was at uni, I thought there'd be two really good things to do. One would be, because I was studying science, would be to cure cancer, and the other would be to win an Olympics. She decided to go with the Olympic aspiration, and she joined the AIS. At the 1992 Barcelona Olympics, there were still only three events on the women's cycling program. The road race was 72 kilometres long, and it's not just a physical event. Cathy had imagined this race a thousand times. She thought there were several ways it could finish, and by the time she lined up at the start, she was prepared for all of them. I worked out several scenarios of how the road race could pan out, and one was it would finish in a sprint, one would be um, I'd be a in a breakaway with a group of riders and come to the finish, another was there'd be riders ahead, I would leave the group attack, catch them, but sneak up and then attack them. So when it was happening and that last scenario was um, coming true, it was like I'd been there before. <laughs> We were going up the hill on the last lap and I looked around and saw everyone was breathing really heavily. I thought, it's time to go. So I've just gone for it. And then I've caught the two girls ahead, but instead of letting them see me, I've snuck up the side and then just started sprinting at them. And they're going along the side of the road. So I just stayed right, I didn't ride in the middle of the road. I've ridden right on the side of the road. And before I'd come to them, I didn't come up slowly. I've started sprinting full gas. So when I, as soon as they see me, I'm coming past so fast they can't get on. Then they look back to see who else is coming and it's too late. So by the time I've gone past, they didn't even know I was there. And if I hadn't rehearsed it, maybe I'll, they would have seen me coming or 
and it wouldn't have worked out like it did. This wasn't just another indication of the end of the drought. Kathy Watt was the beginning of a tradition. She also won a silver medal in the pursuit. And since her performances in Barcelona, Australian women have been among the top ranked nations in women's cycling. Women's cycling would be lucky if it got three lines in the, the papers here, but after I won, when I came back and rode the Australian Championship, and I ended up winning it, but we had all the news stations and helicopters following the women's race, and the next day the guys got a little byline in the paper. <laughs> there was one sport in which the AIS team building and the sting of Montreal drove a determination that however good anyone else got, we'd be better. You don't have to find an excuse for not winning if you don't lose. The Australian women's hockey side won the gold medal at the Seoul Olympics in 1988, but then failed in Barcelona. Enter Rick Charlesworth, silver medalist in Montreal, very disappointed about not going to Moscow, played 227 games for Australia and pretty handy generally. Go, Jules, come on! He was a politician, a cricketer, state cricketer, and a doctor, and arguably one of the best uh, players to ever step foot on um, a hockey field. Contest there! Come on, what are we doing? A squad of elite players was put together and a program of international competition was scheduled. I had gifted athletes and uh, I understood that and I was lucky and knew if you want to be a successful coach you better have gifted athletes. Rick was very good at, at bringing everyone together and um, whilst acknowledging individuality, you had to conform to the, the team ethos. And I hope we can go one better and win the Olympic gold in Atlanta. Thank you very much. I actually think teamwork is a, is a moral issue because moral questions are about knowing what to do and then doing it. And most of us can decide what's the right thing to do, whether or not we do it sometimes is, <laughs> is the question. But in a sporting environment, it's about doing the right thing at the right time for the right reason. Rick Charlesworth was building a winning machine. Between 1993 and 2000, the Australian women's hockey team won every major competition. And one of the things that you have to do, even though it doesn't make your record look so good, is you have to be, you have to take risks and experiment. Otherwise, you don't build depth in your squad. No, 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 Marty, no, no, no. You've got to come back through there. You know the rules. Winning all the time reads well, and it fits the job description perfectly. The danger, of course, is that you become overdogs, and a team that has been designed and trained to win continuously might need to be inoculated against the risk of defeat by being defeated. It'd hurt, but it'd be useful in the long run. The belief was that we had this chronic achievement syndrome going on and of course they, the, the coaching staff were gravely concerned about this because they thought that we were going to be a bit like near enough's good enough and we'll just turn up and we'll we'll win again so they made it uncomfortable for us after we had been successful for a while the challenge was to maintain that over a period of time i didn't believe it was possible to do what we did when i started no one wins by chance at the Olympics, you've got to earn it. The women's hockey team won gold at the Atlanta Olympics. Things were going well with the winning machine. And on the final night of the swimming program, we would witness a very rare phenomenon indeed. The supreme talent and the underdog in one person in a single event. Kieran Perkins would swim in the 1500 metres freestyle. He was the defending Olympic champion and the world record holder. He was a dominator, and yet he was in terrible trouble. There was a day and a half between the heats and the finals, and being part of that team, we didn't know what to say to him. I think most of the team ignored him for a day and a half because it was, what a shame. You know, he's won by 25 metres in Barcelona, and what a horrible way this is going to be for a great champion to go out and potentially finish his career finishing last in the 1500. You know, there was rib complaints and his stroke was lopy and it wasn't working the way that it was. He'd struggled to get into the team. He hadn't gone well in the heats. He'd only scraped into the final by 0.24 of a second. He was swimming in lane eight, which is the graveyard shift for swimmers. We're brought up to believe that that's the worst lane. That's the lane you can't win from because it is the slowest qualifier. You are 
the worst in the final if you're in lane eight, so therefore, obviously, you've got no chance. 30 laps ahead of him. Lane eight. No chance whatever. The stage was now set for the most delicious confection on the Australian sporting menu. When he went into the water, Kieran Perkins was the world champion and the biggest underdog in history. You know, my best race plan was to get out fast because whatever speed I set, I could hold that all race. He got out very fast. The question for the next quarter of an hour would be, could he stay there? Being in lane eight, I couldn't see the guys that I was racing against. I think if I was right beside Daniel in the final, I probably would have paid too much attention to him and not swum my best race plan. Halfway through the race, and Kieran's still in front. We were thinking in the stands, when does he hit the wall? When, you know, in swimming terms, we talk about dying. When is he going to die? When's he going to hit the wall and fatigue? This is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like this. Because I was in lane eight, because I couldn't see him or any of the other guys in the middle of the pool, the only choice I had was just to get on with my race and swim my race the way I needed to swim it. This is one of the most emotional things I've ever seen. When you look at a modern Olympic swimming pool, um, every lane is two and a half metres wide, every lane is 50 metres long, every lane is the same depth, um, every lane has nice big round lane ropes in it. Um, they are actually all of the same. It's the same water, it's the same distance. You've just got to get over the fact that you were the slowest qualifier and give yourself a shot. One of the great swims of all time. This is all about courage. You are seeing the best of the best. You are a superstar, Kira Perkins. Tone. If you actually look at that footage, when he gets out, his back is just this purpley blue white colour. You know, he had nothing left. There was no oxygenated blood left in his body. He had just given everything he had into that pool. And I'm surprised he was able to celebrate. I'm sure it was just adrenaline that got him through the celebrations because he was spent. What a way to do it, though, winning gold. Kieran Perkins won the Olympic 1500 metres title twice. The first time he won it by half a lap and broke the world record. The second time he was 20 seconds slower and had a purple back. Australia liked both races, but maybe we liked this one more. It's again, it's part of who we are, you know, it's, it's part of what makes Aussies, I think by and large, not take success for granted. You know, we don't assume that we're better than anybody else. And, that allows us to keep pushing and keep fighting and keep challenging and keep trying to be better, as opposed to sort of, ha, well, I'm here now, it's all over. You know, I don't have to do any more. Um, it's, it's never enough. Another Australian, Daniel Kowalski, finished second to Kieran. That was Australia 1-2 in our event. It's official. We were back. Australia would win nine gold, nine silver and 23 bronze medals and would finish fourth in the medal tally. The Australia that approached the 2000 Olympics would be a very different country from the one that had hosted the 56 Olympics. In 1956, a young nation of nine million people had tentatively opened its doors and invited the rest of the world in. At the dawn of the new millennium, it would be a more mature nation of 19 million people, a more experienced and culturally diverse people who would confidently invite the rest of the world to come here again and be thumped again in a wide range of different sporting disciplines by a completely new generation of confident and very, very determined underdogs. And there was one event 
that gathered up the Australian community as one, and with it the international sports community, including all the people who don't even think they know anything about sport, and it made them all feel good at the same time. In under one minute, something happened that went beyond Australia and beyond sport. If you don't want to know the result of this race, don't watch next time. There's a fair bit else happened in sport since then too. Up to you. We'll be here anyway.